Hello, welcome everyone to episode six of The Reset Show. Um, I'm joined by Belinda, as always, and Emma and Katie Austin, and we are honoured to have as our very special guest today, the renowned Future of Work strategist, Heather E. McGowan. There's Heather over there on the screen. Hello, Heather. We'll, we'll talk to Heather in a moment. Heather is, amongst many, many things, an author. Uh, she's written a couple of books. The most uh, recently published one I referred to in our trail for the show, which is called The Adaptation Advantage, which she co-authored, which has already had to be rep reprinted twice and is probably heading for the third reprint, I imagine. I'm going to hand over to Belinda to give us a quick further introduction and start the conversation rolling with Heather. We've got a lot to get through in a short time. So over and out, uh, take it away, Belinda. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank you so much for joining us. Our show is all about resetting. It's about taking advantage of what is a, a massive disruption in the world to think about actually how can we how can we do this better and how can we help organizations be better now in the book you say that um, to maximize human potential we need to put humans at the center of every value proposition now that totally chimes with our approach so just kicking off with that i just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that looks like well, you know, look at it from a, from an educational perspective. Right now, um, you know, I'm U.S. based, so it's got I've got more of that sort of information than global information. But in general, we sort of look at humans as units that we have to download information in and then test to make sure that they've con you know received and stored that information, which is dropping in relevance as the world speeds up. We're not paying attention to what that human could do if you focus on maximizing the potential in that human, as opposed to thinking of it as just a vessel. So start there, because if you look at the, the world of work, anything routine or predictable can soon be achieved by an algorithm. So why are we treating humans like vessels for routine and predictable information and tasks? If we focused on lighting the fire in humans, so we start motivating them internally as opposed to externally, we're the only species that's tripled our lifetimes. We're the only species that lives in climates that were previously uninhabitable. If you let humans do what humans do well, there's going to be no problem. But we've stopped doing that. You know, from the second or the third industrial revolution, we just try, just kind of pushed people through a factory pipeline to create a deployable workforce. And that worked when the change rate was relatively slow. But as we were talking about in the, in the kind of the upfront just before we went live, the virus has accelerated every change factor that I identified in the book for the most part. You know, um, we're faster in our digital transformation. We're faster in our migration to the cloud. All that's going to make it faster for technology to take over tasks and all the more imperative to put humans at the center. And when it comes to the workforce, we still hire people based, based upon past skills and experience to do jobs, in many cases, and increasingly jobs that have never been done before. Mm -hmm. So why are we looking at it with that sort of static backwards looking view? It's like we're driving a car We've been looking in the rearview mirror. Now the car is going three times as fast and we're still driving looking at the rearview mirror. And obviously we, we can't have this conversation without sort of referencing what's happening with the, with the pandemic. I know that, you know, you talk in the book about the need for working with leaders to embrace change, but, but, but avoiding this concept of the burning platform and instead talking about burning ambition. Right. I'm wondering, is there a nuanced change in that, given that the context that we're now in and how rapidly this change is happening? Yeah, so a lot of people don't know the, the reference to the burning platform. It was a, an oil rig explosion off of, I think there was an, it, the Atlantic oh, okay. Sea, and they, they asked a, 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 the platform that the oil rig was on caught fire. And um, one of the survivors had jumped like three floors of the top part of the platform into the water, knowing he had like, you know, two minutes to survive because the water was so cold. And they asked him why he jumped. And he said, I would rather, you know, uh, fry, survive than fry. You know, it was, it was probable death instead of certain death. And that gave birth to the idea of you need a burning platform to motivate people. You literally need to light your employees on fire. What an absurd idea. Nobody makes their best decisions in absolute fear and panic. In fact, they make their worst. So my friend Peter Sheehan um, is the one who coined that sort of don't make a burning platform, make a burning ambition, which is take it from the external to the internal. Focus on how to motivate your folks based upon their own sense of values and purpose and passion. Have you had any surprises 
in terms of you know the way that the, the pandemic has kind of perhaps sparked some changes that perhaps you weren't expecting yeah i mean it, it's not surprising to me that people have figured out that you get better results when you treat humans better i mean it's a pretty simple idea um but scaring folks in the middle of a pandemic doesn't work threatening folks in the middle of a pandemic i think people figure that out relatively quickly um, the pleasant surprises I've seen is the organizations who have realized, like parents, for example, that's a huge area that's not getting enough attention. If you are a parent right now, you're also a teacher. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get your kid to dial into Zoom. You're dropping them, he, him or her off, you know, or are they off uh, two days a week, maybe worried about them while they're there. You know, um, you may be, depending on your financial resources, all sharing a device. Um, and so the companies that have come out and said, you know what, next Friday, we're just, next Friday's off for all parents or indefinite, an indefinite vacation for parents. Or if you don't need to, if you don't have to be on a meeting from one to three and that's the most important time for you to settle your kid down after coming home from school or getting them to dial on a Zoom or, or Teams or whatever it may be. Those are the companies that I think really get it. Not enough, nowhere near enough are getting it. But um, I think Salesforce is one of the ones, there've been a couple of them who've come forward and said, we get this burden and we value you uh, as employees and part of our company. So we want to do everything we can to help you right now because you're doing two or three jobs. And it's, it's, it is absolutely unfairly falling on women. I read an article the other day that in the, in the U.S. it's setting women back more than a decade. Because right now in the U.S. women do five years of unpaid caregiving if you're a parent. Um, and you don't get that back and there's a lost revenue in terms of your career cycle and um, now it's all kind of happening at once. So the companies are getting that, for example, and that's just one dimension. I think I'm, I'm pretty impressed with them, but so many more need to get it. Mm, thank you. Thanks for that. Just want to pick up on one point before we go back to B that, that you mentioned there. As you said at the beginning, you know, this stuff's obvious, right? And, you know, we've been talking to companies for years about if you get it right with your people, everything else will fall into place. We're still having a battle convincing, you know, obviously most of the organizations we work with get that, otherwise they wouldn't work with us. There's still so yeah. many organizations just, just don't get this stuff. And I just wondered if you had any insights on why that is and, and how we really elevate that, you know, that, or, or, or fast forward that conversation. So companies start to go, oh yeah, you're right. Because it is really obvious stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's really obvious. And I think the tension is that the world is speeding up. You know, as I mentioned, it's been speeding up in terms of you look at change rates and speeding up even more so by the virus in terms of, uh, you know, it, we're, uh, we've sped up five years in the first two months, according to McKinsey, in our uh, digital transformation. And as Centra said, we were about 20% migrated to the cloud and they thought the next 80% would take a decade, but based on what we did in the last few months after the pandemic, it's now going to be five years. So when you look at that speeding up, so ten, companies tend to look shorter and shorter ter term because it's speeding up. The irony is you need to look longer and longer term. So, you know, this kind of quarter to quarter view of things, sure, you can cut people and bottom line looks better for a quarter, but you just cut all your tacit knowledge. You know, you cut your ability to innovate to your next idea because you took all the wisdom out of your organization to, you know, f turn a few tasks over to algorithms and cut a few, cut pay on a few people. Um, the companies that get that longer term are going to be the ones that win, but we might have to go through a brutal period of creative destruction for people to get that because I think the this rate of change in technology has made us shorter and shorter terms in our thinking at a time we need to get longer and longer in our thinking. What other more creative ways can organizations um, that are in this deep crisis support people? I'm going to say people more generally in the organizations. That could be parents and carers or people more generally. Well, to talk to the human like a human, you know. So even if you can't afford unlimited time off, you can afford to call up your, your folks and say, hey, let's, what's going on for you today? What are the things you're facing and how can we structure your day around your priorities? Because your employees, are, if you give your unlimited dedication to your employees, you're going to get it back in spades. And so, um, you know, companies that can say, hey, listen, I get it. You've got a rough day. Why don't you take the morning to deal with your family? I'll talk to you this afternoon. Maybe you'll do a longer day tomorrow. Maybe you'll pick up some of the time on Sunday, depending on when you can fit things back in. But allow the employee to set their own priorities. Because we're all 24 seven now. I mean, one of the studies that came out right after the pandemic is, yeah, we're not commuting anymore, but our day's 48 minutes longer, you know, and then Microsoft found that people weren't using email as much 
until after six o'clock at night and then six to midnight it was picking up. So the day is getting longer and it's getting you know, structured differently. Acknowledge that. Um, the folks who are watching the clock and that horrible tracking software, just forget it. That, that is the first way to erode trust and all your, your value with your employees if you're spying on them, for God's sakes, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so drop that stuff. Trust your employees. Uh, my friend uh, Dove Seidman says that the only legal performance enhancing drug is trust. I have to believe with them. <laughs> this is a time to go forward with trust and gratitude. Perry, I know you've got a, you're sitting on a question. I can I can tell by your expression. It's like you have a sixth sense, B. Um, <laughs> Heather, uh, last year when the Business Roundtable made their declaration that it wasn't just about shareholder yep. value, it was about stakeholder value, I had a little moment of joy inside me. Um, however, that was pre-pandemic and also it was possibly just catching a groove on purpose-led business and so on. Um, what's your view on when, when we can start to see business that have a conscience and have a multiple set of values other than just a pile of cash? When are we going to start to see that shift in, in your view on what you see in the market? Well, I'm going to quote uh, the late, great RGB, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said that she was a belligerent optimist. I, I, I'm going to take that mantle as far as I can. Um, I'm going to agree with her. The, this is a time to be a belligerent optimist and to hold those guys, guys, gender neutral guys, uh, to the claim they made in August 2019. And... Um, I saw early in the pandemic, and I haven't I haven't had a way to kind of audit this, but uh, Rachel Carlson of Guild stepped forward just when the pandemic went into lockdown. She's the CEO of Guild Education, which is uh, an organization that manages your um, educational benefits for your company, just the way healthcare does. Um, it's a billion dollar company read, uh, led by uh, women and a team, team of women, actually. Fantastic company. I did a talk for them a couple of years ago. Um, and she stepped forward and said, it's time for CEOs to step up and do what they said they meant in, in that uh, business roundtable. And she got 1,500 CEOs to sign on, I think in 24, 48 hours to, we're going to, if we have the cash to pay our small business ahead of uh, when money is due, if we have the ability to keep services on, if we have the ability to keep employees on, even if we have to cut pay for some of us, uh, if we have the ability to give more flexibility to caregivers, that sort of thing. Um, that was really impressive to have that happen so quickly and have so many folks sign on to that so quickly. Now, I know it's getting more difficult, especially as um, subsidies start to uh, recede and we have to deal with the economic realities when the pandemic hasn't gone away yet. In hard hit industries like you know restaurants and retail and travel that can't just do everything by distance and entertainers, my God, if you know an entertainer out there, they got no option, whether it's Broadway or movies or, or um, musicians. Um, so I was impressed by that. I'm, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next six to 12 months. But that early move, I thought, was, was quite good. We have a few more questions coming in in the chat. I'm wondering if it's okay for me to fire them your way. Sure. Um, one from Pear um, is less of a question, more of a reflection. And then one from Sam, which is more of a question. So if I start with Pear, he says, I think... One key to this, referring to the conversation we were having earlier about um, how businesses can help their employees, not just by reducing hours, is one key to this is to start measuring other things than working hours. So more of the, I don't care when or how you get your job done. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I never understood how measuring time was a good, I mean, unless you're scooping ice cream and you gotta cover a shift, Measuring time never made any sense for most of what we do. It has it for several decades. So yeah, I'm sorry I, did, I didn't make that clear. I never thought that was a good idea. When I said pick up time on Sunday, I didn't mean cover hours. I mean, just sort of get through your to-do list or whatever it is you're working on, however much time you may need. Some people may can work 12, 15 hours a week. Some people need 60. Yeah. But I think most of us shouldn't be working 60. We make bad decisions when we're exhausted. We need to recreate, we need to recharge. Uh, we need to connect with our communities. We're highly isolated. It's not good for us. Yeah. It's back, it reminds me of it's back to this central theme that you've touched on, Heather, and that um, Emma touched on as well, this notion that human beings were actually really good at 
at living our lives and doing what we need to do if, if, if we're allowed to do that in the right circumstances. And, you know, when we, things get put in our way and that's what causes half the problem. So, for instance, measuring time, as you said, it's, yeah. um, it's Victorian. Um, I'm, I'm digressing because I need to move back to uh, the question from Sam, which was uh, related again to this before we move on. Um, how do we stop the day getting longer? <laughs> I, um, uh, how can we actively support that or, or, or do we actually insist on that? What, I'm guessing this is coming from the perspective of, of, of leaders within an organization. What's their responsibility? How do you, what can they actually actively do to help people um, to take that stuff on board? Well, the, the leadership section of my book, I cover some of this stuff, not time so much directly, but we're coming out of this era that John Hagel refers to as scalable efficiency we were really focused on how much you could produce as a human. Now that technology can do a lot of that stuff, we need to refocus. And our leadership needs to move from driving productivity with these sort of set experts that aren't supposed to be questioned to leading with uh, vulnerability and trust and establishing psychological safety. So my job as a leader is not how much productivity can I squeeze out of you, but how do I inspire you to create the next thing? How do we inspire you? And that is far less about time. And so the day doesn't get longer. Um, in fact, it might get shorter because you may do your best work if I get you in the right conditions and I establish the right type of safety and, and the right type of inspiration that you may just you know, be on fire for four hours a day, really turning on some really interesting insights as opposed to draining the productivity out of you out of nine. So it's part of the overall shift. It really begins with leadership. Thank you so much. And um, just to reflect back, as, as some, some more comments from Georgina, who asked the original question, is um, just talking about some of the things that are happening within her organization. So creating a global framework of principles for our, as she calls, philosophy of work, which is moving away from the very traditional notions of work, what we're now. So it's exciting. Perry, um, I'm minded that some of the comments Heather just made about um, getting the best out of people in the workplace are very much in, in your territory in terms of your recent work around energy. Is there anything you want to pick up on on that? Well, simply the, uh, you know, complete concordance with uh, Heather's talking about in terms of human vessel and variable forms and, and so on. Uh, and I guess what I've seen in some of the more enlightened organisations is there's a recognition that this uh, value exchange of my effort uh, in, in service of something else comes to life in certain circumstances. And too often we just oppress that with a routine and a sort of, you know, a vacuous KPI or something. So I'm loving this almost free form style where people are finding their energy rhythm and they're going, this is when I'm at my best with the circumstances I need and they're engineering the circumstances to do their best work. Uh, and so I suppose my only thought is that does require leaders to get out of the way because they're yeah. programming the machine at the moment. And it takes a really bold step for a leader to go, I'm going to turn over the programming to you guys. And I'm just going to create the, the, the framework that this sits in. And I suppose my, my only sort of reservation on it is that leaders just either don't think that's a viable option and haven't confidence in their own people, or they're power hungry and they want to hold on to it. So it's how we get over that, I guess. You know, I did some consulting work for a, a biotech uh, company more than a decade ago that um, to get a job at that company, I had to have a, a doctorate just to get in the, their base mostly, other than, you know, support jobs. Um, so everybody there was very highly educated and they knew that that was a liability. So to get a certain, I think it was above director level, you had to go through this rigorous screening. And if you relied too much on your PhD or your expertise, you couldn't get above that level because you would have that, you know, if I'm a hammer, everything looks like a nail mindset. And they wanted to avoid that, which I thought was brilliant, especially for that long ago. Just to reflect on, on the points you're making, it's really fascinating. And I'm going to kind of put a bit of a, a challenge out there. To what extent do you think that we're kind of creating our own realities in terms of this whole work, how I want, when I work, want in a way that works for me? But I, I, I guess my challenge to all of us is that whole be the change you want to see in the world. And if we start to all work in ways that work for us, um, because I guess my, one of my observations is quite often you sort of just assume that it's not allowed. And when you start to work in different ways, if you're doing a great job and you're performing and your output's brilliant, then my experience has been very few people, apart from the, the, the one bad boss I had, are going to say, you can't work like that. And I, I just wonder what everyone thought about that, if it's a bit 
uh, utopian or if, if you would agree with that sentiment. Yeah, well, I'll jump in because I, I would agree with it. And I would also remind you that even in a, a pandemic in a global recession, if not depression, there's still a war for talent. There's still a need for highly educated folks. So if, if we are that group, I, I think, you know, a lot of us are, it's up to us to start making that proclamation so it doesn't become optional. And especially for the folks who can't make that proclamation. Yeah. Thank you. I've got a question from Debbie and then I think I'd, I'd love to ask some questions about learning and the future of learning and, and, and how that all fits into this big picture. Um, but Debbie's question is, um, what do you sense are the best changes that people have adopted under the pressure of COVID, but that have made significant improvements to how we work and that we should keep and not to, ret not to return to the old ways of doing things? Well, I, I want to um, make sure that I'm aware of my privilege when I answer that question, because mm -hmm. COVID is not you know, it's the same storm, but different boats. Mm. I, I'm comfortable in my, you know, good sized home in Boston talking to you guys without having to wear personal protective equipment. I don't have to put my life in danger to do my job. And I don't think we're done with our gratitude for the folks that do. Mm. So um, it hasn't affected us all evenly. If I lived in a house where I had three kids and we all had to share a laptop, I probably couldn't have this much sustained attention on you guys. Mm -hmm. um, so I have that privilege as, as well. Um, uh, being aware of our privilege, being aware of our inequities is one of the most important things I think we could be doing right now. Some of us are doing it, not enough of us. Um, so that is, a, as hard as it is, is a positive. Warren Buffett wrote in his 2001 um, shareholder letter about the kind of dot com bomb he saw coming. When the tide goes out, you can see who's swimming naked. And um, he was talking about uh, a raging market can hide bad business models, but it's also applies to this moment. The tide's out and there are a lot of naked folks and we've got to help them out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a positive. Uh, I think for those of us like myself with the privilege, I've had been able to spend more time with my family. My wife has uh, a job in Manhattan. We had an apartment in Manhattan and I was in an airport all the time. I, I have had the ability to uh, spend a lot of time with my family. My father has dementia this December. I'm going to be able to spend three weeks in Florida and work from there. So I've had a, you know, a tremendous amount of privilege to be able to spend more time with my family. Some of us have had that. But we really have to acknowledge that this pandemic is not hitting us all equally. Those of us who've had that privilege need to realize uh, about those of us who haven't and what are we going to do about it. Mm. Thank you That's so much. That's my view. Uh, and it expressed it so powerfully. Thank you. We were talking um, before everybody else joined about kind of like a movement from me to we. Um, mm -hmm. Is this the time this is happening? And is that in contrast to what's happening in, the, in our sort of political spheres? Tell, a little, tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that. Yeah, so we're highly politically polarized, particularly in the US, and I'm not going to hit the third rail on that one to go too deep into where I fall on it. But if you listen close enough, you can probably figure it out. Um, yes, I think that there's a, so much going on that suggests we're, we have the opportunity if we're belligerent opt optimists, and if we are intentional and insistent to shift our mindset from me to we. So we in the U.S. have, we don't have universal health care. In October, you didn't care if your Uber driver had health insurance. Now you sure do. Um, you didn't care if your, uh, your Uber driver had paid sick leave. Now you do. You didn't care if your grocery worker could stay home if they were sick. Now you do. Um, there have been things where the me has been threatened because we haven't taken care of the we. Climate change is the biggest me to we moment, um, and we've got to do something about it before we're in absolute catastrophe, whether it's wildfires raging in the, in the West here, or we've run out of letters for our hurricanes, we're back around the alphabet again, and it's only early October here in the U.S. Um, you know, uh, Lululemon CEO announced the other day she has more stores closed because of climate change than the pandemic. Whoa! Um, you know, we can't not pay attention anymore. The Black Lives Matter movement and the George Floyd protests. Um, I live uh, about a half a mile from the longest sustained protest in, in, the, in Massachusetts and perhaps the U.S. They have a Black Lives Matter protest every Monday at 530. Um, the Black Lives Matter is the largest protest, I think, sustained protest in the world, given how long it's been going on. We have racial inequities we just can't uh, ignore anymore, whether it's 
uh, treatment by the police or healthcare inequities or financial inequities. Um, we had social immobility in the U.S. Raj Shetty said if we were born in 1940, you had an 80 or 90 percent chance of doing better than your parents. By 1980, that dropped to 50 percent. So now it's better to be born smart than rich. Great for smart for rich people? No, it's terrible for all of us. Those are lost Einsteins. That's economic activity. Even if you think about it from the me that we're not getting because we've been having a me instead of a we mindset. So I can go on and on because that's my new a new area I'm going to be writing about. But I feel like there's all these moments like we didn't have full support for Black Lives Matter. Then after the George Floyd protest, we've tipped over 50 percent in the U.S. We didn't have enough concern for climate change. Now we do. We didn't have enough concerns for income inequality. Companies didn't really have diversity policies. They were kind of bullshit HR policies. Now they're corporate policies because we realize we need them. So there's all these factors and they're shifting really quickly. And that gives me, fills me with hope. Mm. Obviously, you're a future of uh, work and a future of learning strategist, and I know you speak absolutely widely about learning and how learning, how we approach learning in the corporate world is just not fit for purpose and actually what learning should look like. So sort of for those who aren't sort of familiar with your work, give us a sort of a bit of headline about what your take is in terms of the future of learning, what it should look like. Yeah, before I do that, I just want to give a... Uh just give an explanation. Um, I'm a future work strategist and a future learning strategist, whatever it's uh, not a job I went to school for, not a role I applied for. Um, I saw the world changing and I didn't think anybody was explaining it well. In 2014, I wrote an article on LinkedIn, 100,000 people read it in two days. I started getting speaking requests all over the world. And that's all I do now. I've got 13 or 14 different agencies and hundreds of agents that represent me. A lot of people are going to work that way. You're gonna find uh, unmet need. You're gonna figure out how to formulate yourself into that role. Pick a title, a friend of mine, Donna Ebby, uh, helped me come up with that title because everybody was like, well, what do I call you? What do I call you? And we came up with that title. So that's a, a, a way to think about learning that sort of, we you know, stop asking young kids what do they wanna be when they grow up? Absurd question. Uh, my niece was, Izzy was four at the time. She called me up, she said, Heather, it's career day at school tomorrow. She's going to be nine next Saturday. So this is a few years ago. And I said, what? And she goes, yeah, I want to be a unicorn. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I know you love unicorns. And she said, yeah. My teacher said that's not very realistic. I was like, I don't want to meet a realistic four-year-old. What are we doing? Um, you know, some large percentage of jobs don't exist yet. 100% of them are going to change. 27% of people at most work in the field of undergraduate major, but we ask university students to pick it before they step foot on campus. That means you're picking your future based upon what somebody in high school told you you were good at. First thing we ask each other, particularly in the U.S., is what do you do? Um, several studies in the U.K. and the U.S. have found that job loss can take twice as long as the, than the loss of a primary relationship because it's the loss of everything that you are. So we've been hammering into people to pick, pick a set future self and the world's never been changing more quickly. So our whole learning system around becoming something set is absurd. Mm -hmm. And that's all external. We need to move to extra, internal. What mm -hmm. are you interested in? What do you, what's the first thing you do when, you, when tasks are up to you? What are you good at? What do you care about? Where do those circles intersect? How do you shape a future that's more about that? I have the best job in the world because I made it. I love learning. I love ambiguity. I like talking to people. I didn't discover until I was in my mid 40s, I was actually good at talking to people. I didn't do that before. I was a consultant. So, you know, you never know when you're going to find your sweet spot, but you're never going to find it if you don't start looking and stop focusing on what people are good and, more importantly, not good at. Giving them more chance to explore is so important. I am a big Ken Robinson fan, by the way, the late Ken Robinson. He was really on that as well. Mm. Thinking about that reminds me, um, Justin, of the, the Ikigai model we shared on the earlier well-being show, which is the find something you're good at, something you love, something the world needs and something you can make money from and you're, you're sorted. But um, yeah. Heather, this, this, you know, in, in the book when you talk about the, the learning piece, it really resonated with, with us. Yeah, I mean, I fortunately had the best parents in the world. They were always trying to like, I never fit in at school. They were like, oh, she's really smart, but she's not living up to her potential. That was what I heard every single te parent teacher meeting I had. Um, and then when it came to go to university, I was really good at art. So um, I applied to Rhode Island School of Design and I applied to it in part because it was connected to Brown University. And I, I had two interests. I loved design and I loved psychology. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that industrial design as a field existed, which was put people at the center and figure out what they need. 
And while that's my undergraduate degree, and I did work, I actually did work in the field for seven years, I think it was, and then I went and got my MBA. It still is a North Star for me is figuring out what people need and figure out how to explain it to them. Love that. But we need to take that approach with everybody, not just privileged folks like, you know, like us. I was speaking at the World Bank a few years ago, and that's a filled with over-educated privileged folks, lovely over-educated privileged folks. But uh, one of the guys said to me, he said, you know, he's Harvard this and Yale that and all that. And he said, oh, my daughter's really good at math, but she wants to study anthropology. She should study math, right? And I said, absolutely not. Never met your daughter. First of all, it's not, not up to me to decide, but we need people who, want, who can study people. There's a huge waves of change coming in. But listening to me, if, I, if you think I should, she should be studying math, Helping humans to adapt to change is going to be our number one job. We can't have enough anthropologists, sociologists, and psychologists. I, I'm, I'm going to jump in and because I know we're nearing the end of our time with you, Heather. We're not quite there yet, but I want to just play back what I've been looking at on the screen. Uh, I don't know if you have these in the States, but in, in the UK, probably in about the 90s, you used to get these little dogs, that uh, stuffed dogs that would sit in the back of the car and their heads would nod like that as you drove along. I don't know. Yeah. What I'm looking at is just fantastic as you're speaking is a Zoom screen full of heads going. <laughs> Everyone on the screen is like, yes, 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 yes. Um, it, it feels incredibly indulgent. I feel like I've just created a, my ideal lunch gathering with just some fantastic people. What a brilliant, lovely, rich conversation. Thank you to you and thanks to, to everyone who's, who's been joining in. Um, two things that I'd like to share as we, as we close. One is to, to reference another person who I imagine you're, you're a big fan of. We are on the show as well as Brené Brown, who of course talks about connection and and compassion and I really like the the compassion that comes through in your work when you talk about it this is tough this is a tough time for us humans where a lot of us are scared and I think that is the balm that's the antidote to to the divisiveness that is running through certainly in the US and in the UK uh, mm -hmm. at the moment and I think globally as well in terms of how people are dealing with the pandemic we've, we've got our own political things and so I'm going to reintroduce that. I know that's your starting point in a lot of your talks is remember that this is tough for us. This, the, this acceleration, we're just not built for it. We're, we're not used to it. But that links to my final question to you because in some ways, human beings, what we are best at is adapting, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say. And there's that lovely Meganson quote, which is often attributed, I think, to, to Darwin, isn't it? About, you know, it's not that... It's not the most intelligent, it's not the smartest or the, or the funniest or the one with the biggest, but it's, you know, it's the one who is the most adaptive to change. So if we're so brilliant at it, which I do believe we are, uh, why are we finding it so difficult at the moment? Well, if you look back, we've got about 5,000 years of recorded human history, and most of that time we just survived. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, a few hundred years ago, we set forth kind of three buckets or three boxes of life, which is what uh, Dick Bowles called it. Um, I call it three bands. But basically, we segregated life into education, career, retire. And we made those really rigid paths in our lives. Um, education was over with in the first 30 year life. Career, get on the escalator, ride it up. Escalator has been gone for a couple of decades. Education is now learning. It has to go across the lifespan. And longevity is a reality. We didn't plan for, save for, nor should we have a 30-year retirement. So we've actually put structures in place that have made it harder for us to adapt. Okay. Um, and I think that we need to break out of that. The, the, the identity stuff, which I get into in the book, is, has set traps for us. You know, mm -hmm. Being told in junior high that you're good at math and not good at science and that that'll chart your path to you know, high school, your A-levels for you guys uh, to your university track. It's really an absurd way to set someone's future based upon some test scores as opposed to what they're actually interested in. So I think if we're intentional and insistent and all of us here, it's going to take all of us and more, more than that are on this call. Mm -hmm. uh, it's up to us to build this reality. We are adaptive, but we need the space to do it. And we need to remove some of these questions that I think are, are frankly forming traps that are hurting us. 
Lovely. I think that's a, that's a fantastic call to arms for us to end on. We'll be the belligerent, optimistic army. I'd just like to say thank you so much, Heather. Absolutely delighted and privileged you could join us today. And as you said, Justin, lots of nodding, so lots of wise words. And I'm going to take away a few of those call to arms as well to uh, really think about how I can make some of this happen in my world. So thank you very much. Mm. And I look forward to a time where we can all meet up at a pub and have a beer. It's been an absolute pleasure. I knew it would be. I've, I've, I've just loved every moment I've got to know your, your work. Heather. Thank you so much for joining. Somebody described one of the reviews of your book described as a therapy session. And it totally is. It's so, it's so broad reaching. And there's so much that you can do if you're working in that kind of function where you're supporting leaders or you're looking after people. But just as a, a person with a life and with work to be done, um, it, there's so much in there for, for us as individuals as well. So thank you so much for joining and, and good luck with the next session that you're on today. Great to talk to you guys this morning. Um, I've got some comments there from just from people. Perry, wonderful show, loved it. Head nod to RBG and well played, Heather. And um, Fiona, thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, go well, look after yourselves, and uh, we'll meet somewhere soon for that beer. Thanks, Excellent. folks. Bye Thank now. You. Bye. Bye.